بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العظيم نوينا تعلم وتعلم ونفعل انتفاء وتذكى وتذكى والإثار والاستفار والحث على التمسك بكتاب الله وسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم والدعاء للهدى والدلالة على خير ابتغاء وجه الله تعالى المرضات وقرب ثوابه سبحانه وتعالى Tayyib, bismillah. So, we've reached, uh, done a significant portion of the book, Riyadat al-Nafs. We're um, pretty much halfway through. And so, uh, uh, inshallah, we're going at a good pace. And um, the last scheduled class uh, is the um, last week of this month, but we can also do another week, first week in December. There's no problem. So, we have plenty of time, inshallah, uh, to finish. Uh, and now, this chapter, for this week, we're going to t- be taking uh, chapter 7 and part of chapter 8, because chapter 8 is fairly long. And Imam al-Ghazali, after mentioning everything that he's mentioned, in related to character, in related to curing the heart, in the general ways to do so, and, the sp- and leaving the specific ways for the uh, particular books that are related to the particular diseases in the, other cha- in the other books to come, that he talks about in chapter 7, entitles it, An Exposition of the Way in Which Man May Discover the Faults in His Soul. So now we learned the importance of purifying the heart, and we learned that there's all kinds of faults in the soul. Well then, how do we find out exactly what faults we have? How can we find out the faults that are in our soul? And so he mentions in this chapter the way to do that. And he begins by saying, no, that when God exalted as he wishes his bondsman well, he grants him insight into the faults which lie in his soul. The faults of a man of perfect insight, who has complete basira, are never hidden from him, and whosoever knows his faults is in a position to treat them. Most people, however, are ignorant of the faults of their souls and might not see the moat in their brother's eye, but and might see the moat in their brother's eye, but not the beam which lies in their own. Moat here is the way that uh, Sidi Abdul Hakim Ma translates the Arabic word al qada uh, which is the plural of Qadatun, uh, uh, which is uh, some of the dirt that gets in the eye, and that you, you know that uh, when, you, when it's dusty outside, and, and that you get some dirty, like some dirt and some... Uh, th- stuff that gets in the eye right there. It's called moat. So, meaning that people can see something tiny from amongst the faults in their brothers or their sisters. But even if were they to have a large branch in their eye, that they would be blinded to it. Right? So, moat is a kinai, it's a way of expressing something very small. Right? Uh, and uh, the here, a beam is another way of expressing. A, it's actually like a piece of wood, like a trunk-like thing, that even if someone would have something large in his eye, he'd be blinded to it, but have the ability to see something very small uh, in the eye of his brother. And there's a hadith that our Prophet Sallallahu said, that إِذَا أَرَدْتَ أَن تَذْكُرَ أَيُوبَ غَيْرِكَ That if you want to mention the faults of someone else, فَذْكُرَ أَيُوبَ نَفْسِكَ right? Remember and mention the faults of your own self. Teaching us, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, to focus upon ourselves inwardly and not to be quick to judge other people and find out their faults. In another hadith, uh, the, it has the same meaning, uh, where the Prophet sallallahu said this, these words: uh, that one of you will see the qala, the moat, in the eye of his brother, but to forget the tree trunk that is in his own eye. Uh, and all of these are indicating again, just as someone might have these faults, and these faults could be hidden, that just as outwardly in order to 
cure those faults if it were a physical disease you have to know what the disease is coming from in order to cure it likewise if that disease is in your own heart that you have to know where that disease is coming from so that you're able to uh, so that you're able to cure it now and then he says there are four ways by which the man who would know the faults of his soul may do so first he should sit before a sheikh a scholar who has insight into these faults and hidden weaknesses and put him in authority over his soul and follow the instructions he gives in connection with his struggle therewith as is the place of the aspirant with his sheikh this latter will ascertain these faults and explain to him the method by which they should be treated however such a man is hardly to be found in this age oh that was in uh, the late uh, that was in the late uh, fifth century that that's what about now secondly he may seek out a true a saduk perceptive balseer and religious mutadayin friend and appoint him to be the overseer of his soul so the first and the best way is to sit with the inheritors of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi and the Prophet said, "Kul hadi sabili ad'u ila Allah ala basiratin ana wa man tabi'ani." Say this is my way that I call to Allah with inner sight. Me and those who follow me. And so that there are inheritors of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi who come after him that have inherited the spiritual training of people, of individuals. And as has been said about our Prophet that is enough of, um, of a miracle about the greatness of our prophet is that he created the companions to be who they were able to be. Right? He was the means, obviously, it was ultimately from Allah, but he was the means, sallallahu alayhi wa to create this best generation of individuals after the prophets and messengers. And likewise, is that there's scholars that come after them from the ummah of our prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa that also have spiritually trained people. It also raise them and help them purify their hearts and overcome their bad character traits. This is the first and very best way to purify your hearts by connecting yourself to a rightly guided scholar. Secondly, if that's someone doesn't have that, we still have to find out these faults in our soul, so how do we do it? Secondly, he may seek out a true perceptive and religious friend and appoint him to be the overseer of his soul. So that he notes his circumstances and his deeds, different states and different works that he does. And brings to his attention his in, the inner and external faults, acts and traits which he finds dislikable in him. So he finds a good friend, a true friend, who is not just going to f mention the good aspects of him and flatter him with telling him how great he is. He's going to mention a good friend that's going to actually help him notice some of the faults in his soul that he can't see. And there's a foundation for this in the life of the companions. This was the practice of the wise men, the akyas, and the great leaders of the faith, the akabr. Our Prophet said, al kayisu the wise person, mandana nafsuhu wa amila lima ba'dan mot, who takes himself to account and works for what is after death. That's the truly wise person. So the wise people, this is what they used to do. Um, Umar bin al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, used to say, May God grant his mercy to a man who shows me my faults. Rahimullah imra'an, ahda ilayya uyubi. And that's how it's been, that's one way of translating it. But it's, it's an eloquent word that he uses. He uses use the word ahda. And so it has the connotation of showing him and someone uh, making clear to him his faults, who shows him his faults, but ahda is also to give as a gift. Hadiyah is a gift. Ahda is to give a gift. So meaning that it's understood from the phrase that Umar bin al-Khattab used was that someone who teaches him about the faults that he has, it's actually as if he's giving him a gift. He's giving him a gift. Uh, and, 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 and because of, of him having to learn, being able to learn this aspect of his soul. He also, and he used to ask Salman, Omar used to ask Salman about his faults. When they met saying, what things have you heard about me that you find dislikable? Salman pleaded to be excused answering this. He didn't want to get involved in this. Right? This is Omar al-Khattab. But when he insisted, he replied, 
Some man said, I have heard that you once ate two kinds of food at one meal. And that you have two sets of clothing, one to wear at night and the other for the day. Omar said, have you heard anything else? He inquired, and he said that he had not. These two things, he said, I now renounce. What if, they would, what if the companions would see our closets? You know, how many, you know, undershirts and thobes and pants and shirts do we have and hijabs and and how many different types of food do we eat at one different meal? Probably 15. And he said that that was his, one of his faults is he had two types of food. Right, that he had two different idams with bread. Like, like you could only, you should only have one thing with bread. He's saying, and that's what the that shows how great the companions were. You know, they they thought dates and water were excess. Dates and water. They thought that was excessive. You know, and that uh, at one time there was a, a in the time after in the time of the a later scholar that um, his son, they didn't have that enough money for, to provide for dinner for their children that night. And their children kept asking them, when's dinner going to come, Father? When's dinner going to come? He said, don't worry, it's going to come. Don't worry, it's going to come. When's dinner going to come, Father? He kept asking them. Well, they didn't have anything. He said, don't worry, dinner's going to come. He didn't know where it was going to come from. And lo and behold, someone knocks on the door and brings them uh, dinner, and, and they all eat. And uh, Then he commented on that and said, that he said, hunger, he said, that was for them. That was for the early people, the companions of the Messenger of As far as us, it's not our state. It's not our maqam and station with Allah to go through those different states of hunger. That's how he saw it. Is that we, some people whose hearts aren't enlightened, look at, what a tragedy. That, what a tragedy. They, they didn't have any food and they were always hungry. And, right? Whereas true people understand that that was their reality because everything's from Allah. And... A person will get tried according to the state of his iman. So in reality, that's a sign of their greatness. Was it because that they only ate a lot of food? And that was from the decree of Allah. And that's what this man said to his son. That's for hunger? No, oh, that, that was for them. Right? We haven't reached that level yet to go hungry. Can The Prophet said sometimes we spend three days without food. With the likes of his daughter. Three days. There's a beautiful story related to uh, Sayyidina Fatima and Sayyidina Ali uh, where they had gone uh, a long period of time without uh, eating food and they finally had attained some food and um, someone knocked on the door right when they were about to eat and it was someone poor, right? And they hadn't eaten in two days and they, they preferred that person, they actually, that food they were about to eat, they gave it to the poor person, right? And the next day the same thing happened again. Right, where they were just about to eat, and then someone knocked on them, and they passed it away. I mean, these people were something else, you know what I mean? That, that, which is the highest level of preference, and the highest level is that they prefer others to themselves, even when they're in dire need. That's the highest level. So, this is the way Sayyidina Omar was. Right, he wasn't looking at like I'm Omar, I'm the Amir of Mu'minin. Who's going to tell me and show me my sins? Who's going to tell me the faults that I have? Right, no, he was actively searching for people to help him to come know the different things about himself. So this is why he asked Salman. Also, uh, he also used to question Hudayfa, the Sahab Sir Rasulullah, and he said to him, "You were the confiding of God's emissary, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You were the 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 uh, uh, the." Uh, Mm, the repository or the, the, the possessor of the secrets of the Messenger of Allah. In the matter of the hypocrites, it's known that Sayyidina Hudayfa was given uh, a, a direct knowledge from the Prophet ﷺ about the signs of the end of time. It was also uh, of the, about, a knowledge, about uh, the knowledge of the hypocrites. And so Hudayfa said that, uh, and so he asked him, can you see any of the signs of hypocrisy in me? In this way he used to accuse himself. Despite his great worth and exalted position, for the greater a man's intelligence and position, the less impressed will be he will be with himself, and the more often he will engage in self-accusation. Uh, and Hudaytha re replied to that by saying, he said, no, right, I didn't see in you, you weren't one of the hypocrites that 
uh, the Prophet said, mentioned, he said, but I'm not going to tell anyone else, any, I'm not going to divulge this information to anyone else after you. <clears throat> and so to the extent that someone has a true rank with Allah, will be to the extent that they take themselves to account and they see themselves as absolutely nothing. Now there's an important point here uh, for all of us that we're all, in the, inshallah, we're in the beginning of the path and we've at least started, that you have to be balanced. And there is a, an aspect of the nafs that if someone's not setting out on a path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the lower soul of the individual will just be uh, encouraging this individual to evil and, how, and, and getting it to uh, take part in things and, 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 and putting thoughts in the heart uh, about how you know, good it is and being impressed with himself with vanity and so forth. But then when someone sets out on a path that the nafs will try to hold that person back, right? And so we have to be balanced in the way that we look at ourselves, right? You can't look at yourself like you're great and you have arrived and you're special and everything uh, because the very basis of the foundational part of this, the path of the people of Allah is that you have to, you're never content with the soul. But at the same time, that it could also, it's another extreme to have to lower yourself so much and to look at yourself with such, such disgust that you can't think you can ever be anything. And you'll find people, some people are like that, that uh, they have such a, they, they criticize themselves so much, they're so hard upon themselves that they actually, it is from the nuffs, convince themselves that they can't be anything. Right? I'll never be anything, I'm lazy, I'm this and that and that. And that's another excess. What you have to do is, you have to be a balance between two things. One, that you have to set on a path to Allah. And you have to expend the energy, all the energy that you can in getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And secondly, within that, that you notice the shortcomings that you have. You're supposed to have taqsir, you're supposed to have shahood of taqsir in tashmir. You're supposed to be able to notice your shortcomings while you're doing everything you can to set on the path to Allah. You're not supposed to have just notice the shortcomings when you're not sitting on the path to Allah. And so, that this is a, one of the, the, the afat or the pitfalls, is that the nafs will try to hold this individual back, telling it how bad it is. When it does that, you're not supposed to listen to it. That's when you're supposed to just move through that and, and set your, your sights on the goal, uh, which is getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, uh, that uh, again, it's, it's, it's a balance uh, between those two. This too, however, is rarely to be found. Few indeed are the friends who do not resort to flattery. But tell one about, but tell, but, but tell one about one's faults instead and who harbor no envy. Among your friends, you must, have, you, need, you must needs have one who is jealous or who has an ulterior motive. He doesn't really want to help you. He's something else there. Uh, who deems something a fault when it is not, or a flatterer who conceals some of your defects from you. It was for this reason that Dawud al Ta'i renounced all human company and said, when asked why, what can I do with the people who hide my faults from me? It was ever the desire of religious people to discover their faults though being, through being told of them by others. However, things have come to such a pass with us that the most hateful of all people are those who counsel us and draw our attention to our defects. What would you, if someone told you about one of your faults, what would be the state of our hearts? Will we be happy with their advice? Right. Especially spouses, when you get that close to someone, to see next time that your spouse, whether it be male, or, you know, you're, if you're a male, you're a female spouse, or you're Female, your male spouse tells you something. Right? You do this and this and this. And you do this and this and this. And you do this and this and this. And it just becomes a, a reactionary game of just, whew, right? But if we are really smart in those moments, we'd be writing down, okay, I do that. I do that too. I do that. Okay. Jazakumullah khair. Right? May Allah reward you for telling me the, the faults that I have. I have a lot more. And that's why someone came in the presence of Sayyidina Ali Zayn Abidin and was cursing him and mentioning all these things about him and he didn't he didn't even move didn't even didn't even get angry or anything he said he said everything you've mentioned is in me and what has been hidden from you is even more 
That was the way he, he dealt with that. Jazakallah khair. Everything, that's all in me. And even more that you don't even know about. So, this was the desire of the religious people. This is almost expressive. Okay. However, things have come to such a pass that the most hateful of people are those who counsel us and draw our attention to our defects. This is almost expressive of a weakness in our faith. For bad traits are char of character are vipers and stinging scorpions. And were someone to tell us that under our clothes there lurked a scorpion, we would account this a great favor and be delighted. It would occupy ourselves with removing and killing the scorpion in question. Yet, the injury and pain it could cause to the body would last no more than a day. While ugly traits of character cause an injury in the very core of one's heart, which, it may be feared, will endure even after death and forevermore or for thousands of years. Nevertheless, we are not delighted when someone calls these things to our notice, nor do we busy ourselves with removing them. Instead, we repay the one who thus counsels us in kind and say, What about you? You also do this, that and the other. So that resentment towards him distracts us from gaining any profit or benefit by his advice. This is a kind of hardness in the heart, produced by many sins, which in turn are the consequence, consequence of weak faith. Right? And that's the foundation of all of these things, is the weakness of faith. The very most important thing that we can spend our nights and days doing is to increase our faith, is to increase our iman, and to increase our yaqeen. Everything that we're talking about is based upon that. Right? He's saying that our hard heart is from sins. But sins come from what? Weakness of faith. Meaning that if you strengthen your faith, you're going to, if you strengthen your faith, that you're going to avoid, be able to avoid sins. To the extent that your faith is strong will be to the extent that you avoid sins and do righteous works. And thus will be the extent that you have a soft heart. And one of the greatest signs of the soft heart is how much a person weeps before his Lord, tabarak wa ta'ala. Unfortunately, that because of our hardness of our heart and the weakness of our iman, weeks, days, and weeks, and months, and sometimes years, a'udhu billah, and you go by and just no tears for the sake of Allah. No tears. Dry, hard as a rock. Right? We can't even force ourselves to cry. Never do we even try to force ourselves to cry for our own souls, let alone for the ummah of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and everything that has befallen them. So, this all stems from weakness of faith. Therefore, we ask God, exalted is He, that through His grace and generosity, He should inspire us with right guidance, show us the faults of our souls, occupy us with treating them, and guide us to thank those who reveal such weaknesses to us. So that's the second way. First is you get a sheikh. Second, you get a good friend who's going to help you. But obviously, that friend has to be gentle, right? Even if you're someone who's ready to try to overcome his soul, he should tell you in a, in a gentle way, and, and it should be uh, with good etiquette so that the, the soul doesn't bolt. The third way is to learn of the faults of one's soul by listening to the statements of one's enemies. SubhanAllah. For a hostile eye brings out defects, right? أَيْنَ الرِّضَاءَ أَنْ كُلِّ عَيْبٍ كَلِيلُتُونَ وَأَيْنَ السُخْتِ تُبْلِ الْمَسَاوِي That if someone's looking at you and they love you and they're looking at you with the eye of contentment, so to speak, that it's, it won't see your faults that you have. Whereas if someone looks at you with the eye of displeasure, right, they don't like you, that it will manifest to you the faults that you have. But... Anyways, if you're a spiritual person, that it won't matter to you, even if they are your enemy, that you will find benefit in that. Because they'll tell you things that no one else will tell you. They might be saying it out of <coughs> rancor or envy or some that is hate you, anger, but you benefit from it nevertheless. It may happen that a man gains more from an enemy and a foe who reminds him of his faults than from a dissimulating friend, right, a friend who just tells him how great he is, who praises and speaks highly of him and hides from him his faults. Although human nature is inclined to disbelieve an enemy and to interpret his statements as the fruit of envy still, the man of insight whose faults must necessarily be noised abroad in the statements of his foes will not fail to derive some benefit. So the third way is through your enemies. Fourth, 
The fourth way is to mingle with people and to attribute to oneself every blameworthy thing which one sees in them. For the believers are mirrors one to the other. Al-mu'minu mir'at al-mu'min. A believer, the believers are mirrors to the other believers. And this has a meaning that the believer is a mirror to the other believer, meaning that the believer is like this mirror, which is a tool uh, for an individual to see his good and bad traits. And so meaning that the believer is someone who's supposed to have his relationships with other people and other believers based upon advice and sincere religious advice. And when he does so, that he will be able to show his other Muslim brother the good faults that he has and the bad faults that he has. Uh, the good faults, uh, 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 approaching it in a way, uh, the good faults, the, excuse me, the good traits, uh, approaching them in a way that will cause his friend to remember Allah and thank Allah Ta'ala for those faults and to protect him from vanity and being impressed with himself because of them and also showing him gently his bad faults so that he could overcome them. And they mentioned that, and they mentioned in the commentary of this section that you should never let someone know his faults in public. You should never do it in front of people. And, and, and you'll see a lot of people who don't know the etiquettes of, of Nasiha, right? They'll just stand up right in the middle of a gathering. Sometimes there'll be three, four hundred people there. <laughs> right? And just attack the individual. Right? And it's just, it's all nafs, shaitan. It's all, it's, you're, you're not supposed to do that. Right? Because you're, you're disgracing them in front of all those people. If you really were true in giving them Nasiha, right, you would talk to them and take them aside uh, after that event or that gathering and tell them one on one. So, to mingle with people. Another meaning al mu'minun min al mu'min is, is that just as a mirror allows you to see things that you can't see. Right? There's certain things, certain, you can't, your eyes are here, you can't see what's on your cheek or your neck or these things. You could have uh, some dirt on your body somewhere that you can't see or some type of something you need to get rid of. Uh, and you can't see it except with the mirror. Likewise, uh, with the believer, is is that a you see in your Muslim you see other things in your Muslim brother and sister that you wouldn't be able to see in your own self were you not to see it in them, and this is one of the things about bad character is when you see someone else having bad character, when you see someone else yelling at their children consistently, when you see someone else acting and behaving in such a way, uh, it's you know it's it's repulsive to you, but then you might do the same things. Right? And for you, it's not repulsive because you're just you're doing it. And that's why Imam Ghazali says the likeness of it is is someone who uh, related to his own mucus. You know, you can your own mucus, if you, you know, and it gets a little on you, it's all right. right. What if someone next to you, you're just on the bus somewhere, and, it, right? and it spits on you a little bit of stuff, right? and his little spit, spitlings get on you, right? you're going to be disgusted. Right? Or even, excuse me for being so vulgar, you know your, you know your nose. Like when you blow your nose, right? That for it's your own stuff, right? So that that you know it's not that repulsive to you. I mean, a lot of times you, you even look at it, make sure, and throw it away, right? But if someone else showed you there, look what just came out of my nose. Ah, stuff from my, like it's repulsive to you. The same way in terms of someone's character, that that a lot of times it's not repulsive to you, but when you see it in other people, you just find it disgusting and that's the, li the likeness of character and so and mu'min and mu'min that, he, that you see in them things that you're unable to see in your own self and then there's even deeper spiritual meaning in this hadith uh, as related to the people who have ro rose in the ranks of closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their iman has increased and increased so that that's their inwards becomes like a jewel and the heart becomes entirely pure such that it becomes like a mirror and because of the purity of the heart's mirror of this individual is that when other people uh, look at this individual that they're able to see their own states in this individual right? because they're able to notice their bad character and the, the, uh, the, their state that needs to be rectified.
So al mu'minu mir'at al mu'min. Then recognize their own faults and the faults of others, knowing that temperaments are similar in the following of desire, and that every attribute in a man must be shared by his associate to some degree. Thus one will come to, sc to scrutinize one's own soul and cleanse it of everything one finds blameworthy in others. This constitutes the highest degree of self-discipline, were all the people only to renounce the things they dislike in others, they would not need anyone to discipline them. Jesus, Isa salam, once at, was once asked, Who taught you? I was taught by no one, he replied. I perceived the ignorance of the ignorant man and avoided it. So just noticing people, but not to find faults in them, again, for your own self, to your own self, and to purify your own heart. All of the above are devices which may be restored to, to by those who have no Gnostic sheikh, who is intelligent and insightful into the faults of the soul and compassionate, who gives one counsel in the affairs of religion, and who, having completed the refinement of his own soul, occupies himself with counseling and refining the souls of other bondsmen of God. Whosoever finds such a man has found his physician, and should stay with him, for it is he who will deliver him from his sickness and from the destruction which lies before him. And then chapter 8. An exposition of evidence handed down from men of spiritual insight and provided in the law to the effect that the way to cure the diseases of the heart is by renouncing one's desires. And that the stuff of such desires, right, the madda, the substance, the matter of such desires is following desires. So he's going to explain what this means. No, that you should contemplate what we have said about what we have said above with an eye ready to draw lessons. Your inner sight will be opened and the diseases and remedies of hearts will be unveiled to you through the light of knowledge and certitude. If, however, you are not capable of this, you should nevertheless not fail to believe and have faith through learning and the imitation of those who deserve to be imitated. So understanding it intellectually and believing in it is one thing and then actually doing it and making it a reality is another thing. For faith and knowledge are two degrees, and the latter occurs after the advent of faith, yani knowledge, and comes subsequently to it. God had exalted as he says, God exalts those among you who have, that have faith, and those that have knowledge to high ranks. Right? First he mentions iman. And then knowledge after that. So Allah mentioned knowledge, uh, iman as a first rank, but the, the, but the, uh, the different, the, uh, the high ranks, right, are those who have been given knowledge. Thus whosoever believes that the path to God great and glorious is he, lies in resisting his desires, but does not grasp the cause and secret of this, is among those that have faith. While he who learns the profundities and secrets of these desires becomes one of those that have knowledge, learns about the depths of these uh, things that he's referring to and the secrets there involved. And God has promised the best to both, right? Well, Allah Ta'ala has promised, you know, both are, are good ranks. The text of the Quran, the Sunnah and the statements of the scholars which demand that one credit this thing are innumerable. God exalted as he has spoken of he who restrains his soul from its whims. For him, heaven is the place of resort. <clears throat> he prevents his soul from following its passions. <inaudible> his resting place is paradise. And he has said, exalted is he, they are those whose hearts God hath proven, uh, hath, hath, hath proven unto piety. <inaudible> right, those are the people Allah Ta'ala has tried their hearts. Uh, has, they've, they've proven to be parts of taqwa. And that uh, the meaning of that which is, what, what are these hearts? Right, is said to be, he divested them of love for their desires. In, comment, in commenting on that verse, that he uh, 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 took from them the love that they had for the lower desires. In one time, one of the uh, Mujahid uh, sent a letter to uh, Umar bin al-Khattab and he asked him a question. He said that who is better? The person who has a desire in his heart to do ma'asiyah 
and then avoids it, or a person who doesn't have a desire to do in his heart ma'asiyah and also avoids it. And Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab uh, wrote him a letter back saying that the person who desires, he actually has a desire to do this ma'asiyah in this act of disobedience and then avoids it, these are the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about that, imtahan, that Allah ta'ala tried their hearts. These are the people that Allah Ta'ala has proven unto piety, whose God has proven unto piety. So the Prophet ﷺ said, The believer is beset with five afflictions, a believer who envies him, a hypocrite who hates him, an unbeliever who makes war on him, a devil who misguides him, and a soul which struggles against him. May Allah Ta'ala relieve us from all of these enemies, inshaAllah. He thus explained that the soul is an enemy which struggles with one, and which must be fought. This is a reality. It is said that God exalted as he revealed to uh, David, to Dawood and some of the Israeliyat. O, da o David, warn and caution your companions about indulging in desires, for hearts which are attached to worldly desires are veiled from me. And Isa salam said, Blessed is he who renounces a present desire, a right, desire that he can actually uh, have right at that moment for the sake of something promised which he has not beheld. And our Prophet ﷺ said to some people who had just returned from the jihad, Welcome, you have come here. You have come from the lesser to the greater jihad. O oh, emissary of God, he was asked, And what is the greater jihad? The jihad against the soul, he replied. And Imam al-Iraqi said that this is a hadith related in the collection of al-Bayhaqi in al-Zuhud. Now, and there's another... Uh, uh, proof uh, of the validity of that meaning, although the hadith is weak. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the real mujahid is he that wars with himself for the sake of God, great and glorious he. And this is a hadith uh, that Imam al tirmidhi says is sahih, and it's also found in the collection of Ibn Majah. Right? In Arabic, Al Mujahid man jahad nafsuhu fi Allahi azawajal. He fights against his own soul for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wal muhajir in in the collection, there's another, and, and Ibn Hanban adds a second part of the hadith. Wal muhajiman hajr al khataya with dhunub. The true immigrant, the true person who is, 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 is uh, forsaking a particular place and going to another, who's migrating, the true person who's, who's set a flight, is the person who forsakes any types of sins. That's the true, that's the true hijra. Is hijra. Uh, from the sins of an individual. It doesn't negate outward hijra. That's a, outward hijra is valid. Right? There's, there's a concept of outward hijra. Right? But also there's an inward hijra. The inward hijra is hijra away from, a per, from sins. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, refrain from harming your own soul and follow not its whims into the disobedience of God, lest it dispute with you on the day of arising so that one part of you curses another. How do I quote it? Unless a God, God exalted as He grants you for His forgiveness and protection. And this is, a, Imam al-Iraqi said he didn't, this is, un, this is an unidentified hadith about where this hadith is from. It's, he said that it, he didn't find it uh, with this narration where it came from. Uh, Sufyan al said, Never have I dealt with anything more difficult than my soul, which sometimes helped me and sometimes opposes me. Abu Abbas and Mosadi used to say to us, O soul, neither do you revel in the world, take, in, 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 with, you know, take part in its pleasures, with the sons of kings, nor do you struggle for the afterlife with the ascetics. It is as though you, you had imprisoned me between heaven and hell. O soul, are you not ashamed? Right? You're not a king. You don't get to have all the pleasures of people who are uh, enjoying the worldly th things, but neither are you... Uh, 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 someone who's an ascetic and who's setting out on a spiritual path. Right? So what are you then, soul? He's speaking to a soul. Right? That's how you have to treat your soul like sometimes you have to speak to it. Right? And outside of people here that you speak into your soul, they'll think you're one of those weird people in Berkeley. That, that's, that, but yeah, you're supposed to speak to your soul inwardly. Or you, you can even sometimes speak to it if you're by yourself. No. Because that's what it needs. And this, there's another story coming here to, that, that, will, that will mention that. Anyway, 
Al Hassan al Basri said, An unruly riding beast is in no greater need of a strong bridle than is your soul. An animal that's not tamed yet. You can just imagine, right? That you, you need to put a bridle upon your soul. As Imam Busayri says, Man li biradi jimaha min gawayatiha, kama yuradu jimaha al khayri bil lujumi. That how can I uh, control the bolting of my soul when it's falling into this misguidance? Just as it is difficult to control that, just as it's difficult to control the bolting of a steed, of a horse uh, with reins. Said Yahya ibn Mu'adh al-Razi, fight your soul with the swords of self-discipline. These are four. Eating little, speak, sleeping briefly, speaking only when necessary and tolerating all the uh, wrongs done to you by men. Right, again, to the extent you're able to. For eating little slays desire. Sleeping briefly purifies your aspirations. Speaking little saves your soul from afflictions. And tolerating wrongs will bring you to the goal. For the hardest thing for a man is to be mild and forbearing when snubbed and to tolerate the wrongs which are done against him. And when the wish to indulge your desires and sins stirs in your soul and the delight of superfluous discourse is aroused, you should draw the sword of eating little, not a physical sword, from the scabbard, you know, the sheath that the sword goes in, of the midnight prayer, and sleeping briefly, and smite them with the fists of obscurity and silence, until they cease to oppress you and avenge themselves to you. These are all metaphors. Right? You don't need to actually hit someone with your physical hand, like the same thing that you're doing as you'd hit with your physical hand. You're like, he says, if you're doing that to your soul, uh, when you force it to get up and pray at night. Now, and smite them with the fists of obscurity and silence until they cease to oppress you and avenge themselves upon you and you become safe from their vicissitudes to the end of your days, having cleansed them of the darkness of the soul's desires so that you escape from their hazardous afflictions. At this you will become a subtle spiritual body and a radiance without weight and shall roam in the field of goodness, traveling the path of obedience to God like a swift horse in the field and a king taking his recreation in a garden. He also said, man has three enemies, the world, the devil, and the soul. Be on guard against the world through renunciation. The devil by disobeying him, and against the soul by abandoning desire. A sage once said, the man who is ruled by his soul is a prisoner of war in the well of his desires, and is incarcerated in the goal of his whims, or in the jail of his whims, the prison of his whims, which govern and lead him wherever they wish by means of a halter which lies in their hands, so that his hearts do not all benefit. Said Jafar ibn Muhammad, the scholars and the sages all concur, concur, there's ijma', that pleasure cannot be gained through, save through the renunciation of pleasure. Said Abu Yahya al-Warraq, whosoever gratifies his members by indulging in desire has planted the tree of regret in his heart. Said Wahab, Everything more than bread is desire. La ilaha illallah. Right. La ilaha illallah. And that's what they used to say about Sayyidina Umar al Khattab that he used to eat bread that was so hard that if they would try to give that bread to dogs, that they wouldn't eat it. Dogs literally wouldn't eat the bread because of how coarse that, that bread was. Said Wahab ibn Edward, whosoever inclines toward the desires of this world should prepare himself for humiliation is related after Joseph السلام, had been set in charge of the storehouses of the land and during a state procession in which he rode with some 12,000 of the nobles of his kingdom that Potiphar's wife who was seated on a nearby eminence said glory be to him who enslaves kings who disobey him and makes slaves into kings when they obey him SubhanAllah. O Joseph it is greed and desire which makes slaves from kings which is the reward of the iniquitous while well, steadfastness and piety brings kings forth from slaves. And Joseph replied, as God exalted you, said, Whosoever has piety and steadfastness, God shall not cause the reward of those who do good to be lost. Said al Junaid, last night, finding myself unable to sleep, I arose and began my litany, my weird. However, I failed to find there, in there the sweetness to which I had been accustomed. I want to sleep, but I could not. I sat, but I could not abide this. I wasn't able to do this. So I went outside, and there I saw a man lying in the roadway, wrapped in a cloak. When he perceived me and realized I was there, he said, O oh, Abul Qasim, Imam Junaid, why so long in coming? Yani, why did it take you so long to come to me? Oh, sir, said I, without a time fixed beforehand? Yani, we didn't have an appointment. He said, a time was fixed, the man said. 
He said, I ask God who moves all hearts to move your heart towards me. Yes, he did so, I said. So what do you have you of me? I and mean, what do you need of me? So this man, uh, that he asked Allah Ta'ala that he meet with Imam Junaid. And Imam Junaid, they didn't have any type of appointment. In the middle of the night, when his, his litany that he normally says, that he didn't find the sweetness that he normally has. He was agitated. He tried to sleep, he couldn't sleep. So all this caused him to go outside. But Allah put that on the, in the heart of Imam Junaid because Allah wanted him to meet with this individual because Allah answered the prayer of this individual. So Imam Junaid says to this man, what do, you, you know, what, do you, what do you need of me? He said, when does the heart's ailment become its cure? فَمَتَى يُسِيرُ دَاءُ النَّفْسِ دَوَاؤُهَا Right, the very ailment that would lead to the corruption of the heart, when could that same ailment become its cure? And Imam al says that إِذَا خَالَفَتَ النَّفْسِ هَوَاهَا When the soul is contradicted by its own whims, when it leaves its lower desires. I replied in addressing his soul, he said, so send this individual now in front of Imam al starts speaking to his own soul. Listen, seven times have I given you this answer. Yet you refused to hear it from anyone except the Junaid. Now have you done so? He started speaking in his soul. He told his soul the same thing seven times, but his soul, he wouldn't listen to him. And finally, his soul, he had to have Imam Junaid tell him, and then khalas, it was over there. At this, being still unknown to me, meaning Imam Junaid telling the story, he went his way. Yazid al Uqashi said, Keep cold water away from me in this world, that perhaps I may not be denied it, may not be denied it in the next. I mean, this is this is again subhanallah that's why that when you learn these stories of these people that you come to have, be in awe of them and have love for them and ta'aleem from them because of the way that they were I mean not even drinking cold water because they don't want it to be prevented from it in the next I mean that's subhanallah a man once inquired of Omar ibn Abd Aziz when should I speak and he replied whenever you wish to remain silent and when should I be silent the man asked, and Owen replied, whenever you wish to speak. Right, go against your nafs. If your nafs wants to speak, remain silent. If it wants to remain silent, then speak. Right, when you're in the heat of the argument, it wants to speak, it wants to, or you're in a gathering with your friends, and just it's got to mention this story, right, khalas, refrain. Right, and then when you don't want to do something, right, you'll be in the store, you'll see some type of injustice, right, and your nafs is telling you not to speak, you know, speak in that moment. Right, because as long as enough, when it, as long as it's not pured, as long as it's not purified, that it's going to call you to evil, either by trying to get you to do something or refrain from doing something. So go against it, for in it is good. Said Ali bin Abi Talib, may God ennoble his face. Whosoever desires heaven will forget the desires of this world. Malik ibn Dinar used to roam the marketplace, and whenever he saw something that he desired, he would say to his soul, "Be patient." For I swear by God that I only deny it to you, I only deny it you because of the esteem in which I hold you. He didn't want to, he wanted to honor, part of showing ikram and honor and generosity is generosity and honor to your own soul. That it's possible that someone dishonors his own soul by letting it fall down into lowly things. Since the scholars and sages are thus agreed that there is no path to felicity in the afterlife except the denial of the soul's whims and desires, to believe in this thing is therefore an obligation. The details concerning which desires should be renounced can be discerned from what we have set out above. The essence and secret of self-discipline is this, which should be underlined for anyone who has the book, that the soul should not take pleasure in anything which will not be present in the grave, apart from that quantity which cannot be dispensed with, in matters of food, marriage, clothing, accommodation, and every other thing which one needs. One should restrict oneself to what is necessary and indispensable. For should the soul take pleasure in any of these things, it will grow familiar with it, and upon death will wish to return to the world on its account, and no one wishes to return to the world save him who has no share in the next. So to the extent that we take part in all of these desires, of food, marriage, clothing, accommodation, and everything else will be to the extent that we have love of dunya in our hearts. And to the extent that we have love of dunya in our hearts will be to the extent of the difficulty of the removal of the soul from our own bodies. 
that the less love of dunya that we have in our hearts, the easier it is for the soul to exit the body. The more love of dunya we have in our hearts, the harder it is for the soul to exit the body. And it's, a, it's, a, it's in direct proportion. The only road to salvation in this regard is for the heart to be occupied with the knowledge, love, meditation upon, and devotion to God. The strength for which can be derived from Him alone. There's no other way except to turn to Allah. And to preoccupy your soul with the love of Allah. And praying to Allah. And being in a state of ibadah. When someone's in that state, he'll be pre he, he won't be thinking about the other aspects. The man who is unable to do this rightly should come as close as he, as, to it as he can. There are four classes of people in this regard. Firstly, there's the man whose heart is so engrossed in the remembrance of God that he pays no heed to the world. <coughs> Apart from the bare necessities of life, he is one of the truthful saints. He's from the Siddiqun. It is only because of long discipline and patient abstinence from one's desires that one can attain to this rank. Secondly, there's the man whose heart is engrossed in the world and who remembers God only mechanically. It only just comes to his heart. Doing so with his tongue rather than his heart. Such a man, a'udhu billah, will be destroyed. Thirdly, it may be that a man is occupied with both religion and with the things of the world, with the former being predominant over his heart, yani religion. This man, while he must necessarily come to hell, shall be delivered from it rapidly in proportion to the preponderance of God's remembrance in his heart, right, to the strength of God's remembrance in his heart. Uh, fourthly, there is the man whose heart, although occupied with both, is nevertheless dominated by the world. He will remain in hell for a long period, but must, however, ultimately emerge from it because of the power of the remembrance of God, which, despite the preponderance of worldly concerns, had established itself in his innermost heart. O Lord God, we seek refuge in thee from disgrace, for truly thou art the place of refuge. And so, uh, it's just indicating now uh, just some foundational principles uh, of the choice that all of us have uh, in, in, in wanting to, having our ta hearts become attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and the Messenger of Allah, that Allah ta'ala didn't give anyone two hearts in their body. We only have one heart. And that dunya and akhirah are opposites. And to the extent that there's dunya in one's heart will be to the extent that there's a lack of akhirah. To the extent that there's akhirah will be to the extent that there's a lack of dunya. And then there's people, you know, there's people that have like just 100% dunya. And there's people that have 100% akhirah. And there's people that have 90% akhirah, 10% dunya. And there's people that have 20% dunya and 80% akhirah. And there's people that are 50-50. There's people that have two-thirds akhirah, one-third dunya. One-third akhirah, two-thirds dunya. Right? Everyone's heart is in a different state. And that this is what we have to do is to look to our own hearts and Allah Ta'ala is merciful that He could save us from uh, the punishments of, of the hellfire. And so we hope all of us, inshallah, uh, will enter into paradise without hisab. Hopefully there won't even be any reckoning. Hopefully we'll enter into paradise without reckoning. And, and that, that we all ask, ask Allah Ta'ala. And there's some people that ignorantly say that, oh, as long as I down Iman, even if I have to just do a ghamsa, just a quick dip into the fire, I'm going to eventually... Which one of us can bear going into the, the hellfire? Which one of us can bear the punishment, the torment uh, that takes place there? And uh, we ask Allah Ta'ala to protect us from that completely, inshallah, and to bless us to be people who do righteous works and have pure hearts and have good character in all of our different states and be able to pass that on to our children who learning by our examples every day. And we don't realize, but they, they're watching us and they pick up very closely on the different things that we're doing. And a lot of times you don't see it, and then all of a sudden you hear him speak to another child. And you're like, stuff, that's the way I just spoke to my wife. That's the way my wife just spoke to so-and-so. Or that you just see it, and it's scary. And we, you know, and we're not only, what's two wrongs. Because one, we shouldn't have been doing that thing in the first place. Two, now our children learned it, and we taught it to them. You know, we're supposed to be teaching them, you know, good things and taqwa and getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah ta'ala uh, uh, show mercy upon all of us and bless us to uh, understand this book uh, correctly and be able to implement it properly and implement it to the extent uh, that we're able to do so, but also really have a love and connection to these people who completely devoted themselves to Allah. I mean, th this is a book about people who 
their entire lives are devotion to Allah. And they don't spend very few moments of the day in service to their own lower souls. And the only moments that they do spend in the day in service of their souls is to strengthen themselves uh, for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah ta'ala bless us with the love of them and at least to follow their path to the extent that we can.